Good morning and welcome to Breakfast Extra, the show that's like a Sunday brunch, well, satisfying, indulgent, and occasionally sparked with a bit of sass. And as we dive into today's episode, let's start by acknowledging that it's Men's Mental Health Month, a time to remind ourselves not to get overly worried about the state of the nation. Yeah, but who are we kidding? Nigeria has a way of testing even the strongest mental fortitude, especially if you're on the lower rungs of the economic ladder. If you're a politician, however, or part of the elite, well, it's like having a mental spa day, while the rest of us are left dealing with the daily grind of being Nigerian. Take, for instance, the recent commissioning of the vice president's new 21 billion naira mansion. While Nigerians are still waiting for a minimum wage that can actually sustain them, He's settling into luxury like it's just another day at the office. And indeed, they say it is the office. Talk about living in a parallel universe. Parallel indeed because as the common man is requesting wages that reflects the times with prices rising and forex shrinking the Naira every single day, it seems like the presidency has exactly the same excuse for why the VP's villa costs 21 billion Naira, up from 5 billion Naira, which it was initially supposed to cost. Apparently. It's the same reason we've been propounding as we ask for a new minimum wage. Times are hard, prices are up, inflation and all the gimmicks that you can think of. But boy, the swiftness. They attended to the 21 billion naira structure quicker than you can say Bob's your uncle. Yet labor and trade unions are still locked in weeks of negotiation for a tangible sum to staple the new minimum wage. I don't know, is it me or is it just insensitive? Oh. And let's not forget the commissioning. It was a banquet of its own, an occasion to experience the opulence that the Nigerian ruling class can afford. What can you afford? Three square meals? Wow, not even. And speaking of opulence, let's not forget the ongoing Kano Game of Thrones saga. The courts have fined the Kano state government a hefty sum of, well, 10 million naira for infringing on the rights of the 15th Emir of Kano, Adobayo. Meanwhile, Mohammed Asenusi, the 14th and 16th Emir, seems to be sitting pretty on his throne like a boss, unbothered by the legal drama that's unfolding all around him. It's like watching a real-life soap opera or maybe series complete with power struggles and palace intrigue. All that seems missing is like maybe a couple of dragons, maybe a dwarf, uh, an incestuous family, and I think we can pull this one off in uh, Nollywood. I don't know. What do you think? If there are any takers, please come. Let's produce. But... Let's not dwell too much on the woes of Nigeria. Today is also Father's Day, a time to celebrate Nigerian fathers who have jackpad and are working hard from abroad to provide for their families back home. These fathers are the unsung heroes. Well, they're toiling away in foreign lands to send money back home, only to be met with expectations that they're swimming in cash. I know it's not easy. It's a tough gig, but someone's got to do it. And who else but good fathers? So here's to the fathers who are making sacrifices for their families, even if they're not always appreciated for it. And finally, people, a big shout out to our Muslim brothers and sisters celebrating the Eid today. Despite the challenges of the times, the spirit of toughness and celebration seems to uh, still shine through. We wish them well as they gather with their families to feast and rejoice, even if the feast is more modest than usual due to the economic strain. Here's hoping for better days ahead. So people, once again, welcome to Breakfast Extra. Grab your coffee, settle in and enjoy the show. Mazino Appeal, that's myself. And of course, Judith Atibi, who is my co-host. We are here to take you guys down a Sunday cruise with some laughter as much as we can afford and snarkiness, uh, snarkiness here on Breakfast Extra. And um, hey, it's uh, the reason why we call it a, a little bit of jara for you when it comes to the news, because we're extra. Meanwhile, I'm going to pull a Clark Kent. I don't know if Judith is ready to perhaps maybe join me in the... J J Judith, did you come prepared? Uh, yes, I did. I'm always prepared. I like to think of myself as one of the members of the Avengers. So you... <laughs> keep me with She your does it again. Shot. Do you know what we're doing next, what we're doing today? Oh, yes, indeed, of course. It's time for us to get into uh, the dailies. Well, we're going to do that. But before that, you and I have a date with Kate Hensher. So hey, let's already I get done with that, that one. one or... And then we'll be back for the dailies. Do ah, stay there tuned. there we go. Welcome to my workout session at Fitness Factory in Oniru. These two specimens are here to work out with me. Let's see how they do. I'm going to take it easy on them because they begged off camera. So that's okay. 
So we're gonna start out with some, you know, general body weight, nothing too heavy, but we'll progress, okay? Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? <laughs> so the first one is a workout plank, and then come back and do two jump squats. So I'll show you. Walk out, plank, come back. That's one, we're doing 12. 12. Yes, of that. And, eh? We're not starting with two, we're doing 12, straight. All right. Okay, and you ready? One, two, go, walk out into a plank, come back, jump squat. <laughs> Five more. Whew. Three. Four more. Three. Three more. Ha. One, two, three. Two more. Last one, make it count. Make it count! And one. That's enough content. We are done. Good morning to you, Kate. Good morning. Good to be here with you. Thank you Are for you welcoming. Sure? Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for welcoming us into your routine. This is every morning. Every morning. Every single morning. Every day. Well, it's a fantastic routine, and yes. I love it. I've been through some um, real good exercise myself this morning, and I've loved it. And you were my what do I call it now? You were my accountability partner. Yes. Let me put it that way. Yeah. But well, let's get started by asking you first of all how or why you decided to have such a very regimented <laughs> workout uh, routine? Uh, it was by chance that I found fitness. So fitness found me uh, going through a tough time, like maybe 15 years ago. And I just started working out. And then I found out that I loved it. And then I found out that hmm, all the illness of malaria, the typhoid, the headaches, and this, oh, really? And then my f clothes fit better. And most of all was the feeling. Yeah. The feeling, especially when I go out running, it's, it's an indescribable feeling. Like you can take on the world. You have thoughts running through your head, good thoughts, and you just, it's amazing. I can't explain it, but it gave me a lot of joy. Mm. And I said, why stop? Mm. And then I decided to share with other people. I'm like, nice. let's see who else who mm. is doing this, getting anything out of it. So this is 15 years ago. Yeah. That's a long time to actually have this as a routine. Has that in any way affected the way you look? I mean, oh. age-wise, because you do look ageless. <laughs> <laughs> you see, when they say, uh, for women, I always, because I'm, I'm an advocate for women, I always say, you need to move your body. Your body is designed to move. You only age because you stop moving. 
you don't you don't stop you stop moving then you age it's not because you are aged then you stop moving it's, it's actually the other way around um how do i say it? women need to move especially with getting older you know for me especially in the entertainment industry there's a perception or look that it's over for you from 40 50 and for me i don't feel that way i don't feel the age for me i don't think about it i just keep moving and I totally, totally love it. I do weights, I spin, I do bar, pilates, mm -hmm. I do everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You also dance as well. You're a, I, she's a, she's a see, fantastic dancer. I am dancer. the one in the mall <laughs> when the music is playing. You see me by the cash register. <laughs> Yeah. Dance like no one is watching. I saw a routine choreographed you and uh, another gentleman. Yes. It was so, it was in sync. You I guys, love, I love dancing. I absolutely, and if you look at dancers, their bodies, and it's not about size, trust mm -hmm. me, there are some people who are a bit big and they can move with fluidity. Mm -hmm. So it's a total body workout. That's why I tell people, you don't have to come to the gym, you can dance. Dance 30 minutes every other day, consistency. Mm, that's true. Now, so let's talk about the application when it comes to you being an actress, an mm. actor, generally. Yeah. How has that played into your uh, your work of life? Okay, so for example, a huge example, my role in Blood Sisters, I did a, not, let me say, a reading for it. And as soon as they put me in front of the camera, like a test, they said they have to age me, I don't look my age. Oh. And this is me at 50. Wow. So they had to age me to look older. Like, ah, she looks so young. Same thing for the movie Fourth Republic. Mm -hmm. They had to put bags under my eyes mm -hmm. and all of that. I remember that one. Yeah, actually. just to make me look older, mm -hmm. even though I am older. Mm -hmm. No, you're yes, not. Sir. I am. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop <it>. Okay. <laughs> You spoke earlier about inspiring people. There are so many people who want to go into your kind of work. I mean, being an actor and everything. Um, how would you feel or what do you think you have done in terms of inspiring younger women to go into fitness, to go into acting, and actually to combine both of them? Well, my work speaks for itself. The quality of the work that I do, and having spent 31 years in the industry, 31, that, that's somebody's full lifetime. Adults life. Judith. Yeah, you know, <laughs> um, the quality of work that I do um, over the years, being able to look good and be good at what I do. Um, as an actor, you need to have a full range of motion for yourself, for your character. So being able to be versatile and flip through different roles when you're fit, when you're active, you can do that. I mean, I'm sure if I was a lot bigger, they would be giving me a lot of mama rolls <laughs> with rapper and blah, blah. It won't come across very well, you know, unless I'll have to actively put on weight, then mm. I can look mm. like a buxom lady. Yeah. But because of fitness, I'm able to play a wide range of, of roles yeah. in the industry. But it's not exactly cheap now, is it? Registering at a gym, and I'm not even talking about just expense itself, yeah. the time you have to yeah, invest the, in the it. Wears. Oh, the wears. The yeah. wears, I mean, look at you all sinking up see, your shoes and everything. See. Um, for an average person out there, how easy would it be to get into this kind of routine without spending absolutely too much, especially that Nigeria is the way it is? Okay, going. you don't have to come to the gym. Mm. You are staying in a home. You have a room. Get a mat. Start from there. Wear your shorts. Wear your, for a lady, wear your bra, wear your shorts or your jogging pants. Wear what you have. Get your mat in your little space. Do some stretches, mm -hmm. do some movements, you know, some burpees, some jumping jacks, some squats, and some lunges. You've done four, you can go. That's good. Wednesday, you mm -hmm. go again. Friday, you go again. I tell people at least three times a week, at the very least. Or go for a walk around your neighborhood. That's not gym. Mm -hmm. Dance in your parlor. That's not gym. No excuses. And all of this is investment. Like you invest your money to make profit. True. I'm investing in me. Cool. Okay, so if I was walking into the gym and I met the amazing Kate Henshaw and lady and I'm like, okay, I want to be like you. What are the steps? How many steps? Three steps to looking like Kate Henshaw. What There's no step. Just be yourself. Don't be intimidated. I, I know that a lot of people, when they enter the gym and they see someone like me or someone who is very fit, they're like, ah, I can't do that. Focus on your focus. Just 
Do what you have to do. Don't be intimidated. A lot of people, when they come, they feel intimidated. They feel, oh, I have to lift heavy. Look at her. No, your start level small. is different. Start small, start slow, start and be consistent. And what you do to your mouth? Chop, chop. Let's talk about that. Chop, chop. <laughs> What's your... Nigerians are <laughs> chop, chop. Like. What's your diet like? I don't diet. Oh, I don't. Yesterday, I had a fang and an eba. The day before, I had semu and uh, efo. I've not had it in months. <laughs> I just said, ah, oh, right. Vegetables are good for you. Mm -hmm. I don't starve myself with anything. I don't believe in dieting, restricting myself. Portion control. Your vegetables are good. Your fats and oils are good to make your skin supple. You need protein for your muscle. You need carbohydrates for energy. Mm -hmm. You need fruits and you need water. Why are you starving? You be eating only green leaf. You will die. <laughs> if you are lifting weight like me, you need to eat well. So I guess the, the steps are one step. Just get started. You are a good student. In short, A plus for you. Yeah. You deserve a massage <laughs> after this. Well, Kate, I want to say... <laughs> Ooh, for <laughs> you, for you. <laughs> Kate, I want to say thank you very oh, much. This has been thanks, fantastic. Azina. I've enjoyed my workout. And uh, maybe I might even come back. What time every day are you here? I'm here 10 minutes to 6. Every single day? Every day. I'm going to be here. <laughs> I'm going to be here every They're single day. They're hearing you. Yeah, no, no, this is... Uh, you're my accountability <laughs> partner, so... And you guys can join us too in your private homes, of course, or anywhere that you want to. I mean, just make sure that you get keep your... Keep moving. Yeah, keep moving. That's it. That That's... Yeah, keep moving. Keep moving. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate. You're Thank welcome. You. Oh, I don't care. There's one thing for certain is that uh, when I look at my, my uh, vision board and when I get to my 50s, uh, Ketensha is right there. Right? She's, <laughs> right, she's right next to Ego Boye and, uh, and Omotola. Those are ageless beauties. That was Ketensha there taking us uh, through her workout session. And I do hope you enjoyed it. Mizuno had a sweltering time. Sweltering? I had a swell time. Yeah, what it was sweltering because he was sweating. It was hot. What was it like and for you? It was hot. Oh, it was exhilarating. It was exciting, of course. No age um, after. But at the same time, it reminded me that um, uh, mm. I had to give up something, and I, I've, I've, I need to go back. What are you giving up exactly? Oh, I was, I'm a fit fam now. Unlike you, you were sweating, you are just killing yourself. Well, see, you, the fam. funny thing is, yeah, um, I actually enjoy a good workout. I actually have a routine, but it's not as, uh, what's the word? The one on the bike? On the, on no, no, not, 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 not about being a biker, but I actually <coughs> take walks every single evening. Every single right. evening. Right. But it, the idea is not for physical exertion. For me, it's more a mental thing. So I actually... Ah, to and decompress. It's mental, exactly. Yeah. And remember that it's Men's Mental Health Month. Yeah, and I think that it. that is very important for me. Yeah. Because um, with everything that we do, everything that we go through every single day, um, it kind of like compounds to the back of your head, but you don't know you're storing it. But when I take these walks, it kind of like just like eases Yeah, out it's, uh, it helps you decompress. Uh, no, decompress. No questions asked. Exactly. No, yeah, I, no I questions it. asked. I, I mean, the most important thing is that you get yourself out of bed as much as you possibly can. Keep moving. And just keep moving. That's yeah. very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, and also, there are different apps now and different you know, wristwatches that help you to stay accountable uh, to take in your steps. So I hope you found it exhilarating and I hope that uh, that inspires you at home to get out of bed, mm -hmm. start a walk. But anyway, thank you once again for joining us on the Sunday edition for Breakfast Extra. And on today's show, we're going to be looking at matters on details from inside the news uh, from last week. So far, so good. From the fine of 10 million naira that's now been imposed on the Kano government for infringing on the rights of uh, Adubayaro. We also did have New Central's town hall meeting. This another edition happened, I think it was on Tuesday, if, I, if I'm correct. Wednesday, actually. Uh, yeah, so oh, in right, Joss. I'm sorry, Thursday, actually. Yeah, it was Thursday, there we go. Happened in Joss. And as we were going to try, uh, the, 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 the details of, the, tr of the, new, the town hall meeting was to find a true or lasting resolution to the many crises in the region. And also, we're going to take a look at uh, uh, some big, big stories happening inside of the continent of Africa. Okay, so we have all of this and more if you choose to stay with us. But to kick up the Sunday edition, however, let's bring you the front pages of the dailies this morning from Nigeria and some parts of Africa. And we're going to get started with the very first one, the Punch newspaper. As so we pull up the Punch on the...
And time for us to bring you to the dailies. Let's start off with Punch newspaper. If you are anywhere, you want to pull out your Punch Sunday Punch. The ever story that jumps at you, Nigerian Airlines to fly U.S. South America routes soon, and that's from uh, Kiyamo, the Minister for Aviation. You can find this story on page 36. Right next to it is Tunubu Atiku Governor's uh, Earth Unity at Eid uh, El Karbir. That's Wasella. You can find that story on page uh, 6. A very big one there that jumps at you. Festivities may fuel cholera as cases spread to 30 states. Mm. You can find that story on page 3. At the bottom there it goes, Lagos confirms 15 deaths or your Ogun. Others on red alert. Celebrations increasing rainfall can aid outbreak. And that's from NCDC agency. That's the uh, national uh, agency there for disease control. Right next to it, the uh, family accepted uh, Biola's death June 12 election annulment as God's will. And that's from his brother. You can find that story on page 14. Police intensify search for Fuani MD, three others abducted in Lagos. You can find that story on page 4. How I spent six days in kidnappers' den. Engineer, you can find that story on page 34. Very, very interesting how those two stories are side by side when it comes to insecurity mm -hmm. in Lagos. On pages 8 and 9, governors strengthening grip on states through Lagos, I'm um, sorry, through local government control, that's LG control. And that statement there is from an ex minister. I want to find more on that story. Go on to pages 8 and 9. On page 3, uh, Miati Ala uh, uh, Afenifere disagree on ranching bill. That story is on page three. Gridlock on Lagos Ibadan Expressway as Muslims others travel for Salah. You can find that story on page 44. Foodstuffs exorbitant costs threatens uh, Salah celebrations. And that story is on page seven. It's very interesting that in spite of all that's going on when it comes to our economy, Nigerians will still find a way to go back home and celebrate. Absolutely. In this case, it is necessary. I mean, family mm -hmm. is all you have when there's no money, quite yeah, frankly. So, so you might as well or... do whatever you can. And that's causing the gridlock, which is very funny because I intend to use that path today and I'm hoping that it's going to be free. Mm -hmm. um, congratulations, Marshall, by the way. Um, he knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on now to our next daily, and that is the Daily Trust for a Sunday here. Nigeria's 289 delegation to ILO confab stares fresh outcry. It's a mockery of Tinubu's foreign travel policy. This on page four. And indeed, it is a mockery that after we have a 21 billionaire vice presidential estate only commissioned with a couple more millions, mm -hmm. that we have this again. 289 delegates. 289, and I bet you a couple of them went first class. I don't know yet. We will right. find out. But then, what are we, go what are we talking about here? The wastage of the Tinubu um, uh, administration here just coming to the fore. Why Finiti George steps down as Super Eagles coach? Um, there's a trending tr uh, piece of music by uh, P Squared. Um, you did do like Finidi. You know, I know they do like Finidi. I know they, uh, they always finish that kind of uh, that uh, bit. You, did, did you, did I you need to do it? like yourself or you, but they finish like Finidi George. <laughs> It's exactly, oh it was goodness. trending over the weekend, but um, interesting that he has stepped down. More now for the Daily Trust, 700 million naira gold theft, police traders, TIF over at arrest, torture, extortion, and Salah, Tinumbu National Assembly Governors, others preach unity, police. And uh, the fine print here, uh, Zulum fifth year in office, uh, look at some of uh, the uh, achievements there for the stats and also pictures showing there inside of the photo story. That's uh, all we have for the front page of the Daily Trust. Uh, let's else? move on now to uh, Sunday Independence, shall we? As we pull up Sunday Independence on there, the very first big one that comes out to activist slam federal government states OPS for rejecting 250,000 naira minimum wage. And that's on page two. Insist government's position on realistic in view of inflationary trend Advocate reduction in public spending, increase in IGR, urge workers to resume strike if government remains adamant. Now, we move away from that one now, right next to it, you can find the story on page four. Your sacrifices won't be in vain, Tinubu tells Nigerians, as Atiku preaches sacrifice, love, and peace. And that story is on page four. At the top there, Edo 2024, as the elections are fast approaching. Choice of candidates, page seven. Uh, Wengling uh, uh, threatened APC's chances. Disgruntled uh, party 
wrangling uh, threatened APC's chances. I beg your pardon there. Uh, there's gruntled party chief tents in anti-party activities. All that and more on page 7. Right next to it, Nama refutes uh, claim of non-total coverage of Nigeria's airspace. That story is on page 8. We did have a piece there on our news um, on Friday, on News Now, on News Central TV. Um, moving away from that now, the next story right next to it is Grandma, Grandma set on fire by daughter dies in Undo. Oh my goodness, that is sad. You can find the story on page 7. And when you move to the bottom there, Knox for six years, single term, return to regionalism. Desire for second term, drives performance, says stakeholders. Advise lawmakers to make present arrangement work. That story is on page two. Police reject 2022 constable recruitment. Say list, list flooded with non-applicants. Process marred by irregularities. And that story is on page four. Federal government warns uh, li licensed landowners following uh, Nanja uh, mine collapse. That story there is on page three. I'm very sorry, page five. I beg your pardon. Very sad, all that's happening in uh, Niger. I find a police story very interesting here. Mm. That they are also rejecting their own list. I mean, who put it together? Who allowed for these things to happen during the uh, assessments and mm. all? Their names who absolutely didn't even make it in, uh, who didn't do the exams but are on that list, which is very worrying. Let's move on now to the Guardian newspaper for a Sunday here. Big headline that admits you, Eid El Kabir police beef up security nationwide, release emergency hotlines, Tinubu governors, others extend goodwill to Muslims. At the top for the Guardian, Fashala Odasa, foreign diplomats, others harp on sustainable democracy. And NNPCL properties plan to modernize a state business in Nigeria, says Emma Life. Um, at the bottom for the Guardian, Tinubu appoints new DG for Bureau of Public Enterprise. A new minimum wage Senate not considering seizure of allocations to states, LGs, Adara Modu says. At the bottom for that one, alleged 28 billionaire bank fraud, EFCC confirms arrest, detention of Abubakar Fontua. And heroes of democracy are in South Africa. Uh, that's a piece you might want to read on the back page. And NAWOJ rights group applaud the Guardian's investigative reporting on UPTH. Congratulations to the Guardian. That's all on the front page for the Guardian newspaper. And um, yes. Day, absolutely. Oh. Sunday Vanguard, there we go. All right, let's move on to Sunday Vanguard, shall we? If I could just uh, pull that up. All right, on Sunday Vanguard, Finiti Judge quits Nigeria's 2026 World Cup bid in jeopardy. You can find this story on page six at the very top. The squire as lawmakers plan to end President Governor's, uh, President Governor's second term. And that story is on page seven. Salah, chaos in Kano, uncertainty over Sanusi's Durba after Ado Bayaro moved to stormant uh, event. State government, police taking orders from unknown source. Lagos Ibadan Expressway on lockdown. Tinubu Atiku Obi governors, others preach unity. You can find that story on page eight and page five as well. You move on now to uh, the bottom there. NNPC uh, properties limited with Reeve. Uh, <laughs> that's what's gonna be a tough one for me. <laughs> Revolutionalize. There we go. Real estate. Oh, come on. Are you still sleepy, Judith? I think I am. It's, uh, it's been a long night. Uzo, Uzoma, Eme Lefe, the managing director, there. You can find the story on page six. Right next to it, uh, Power Play re uh, Revelations. Why APC X Chair uh, Ada Adamu opposed Tunumbu's emergency as president, Senator Omishere. You can find that story on page 12. Police open up on scandal. Those who didn't apply recruited as constables. And that story is on page 5. Inflation rate worsens, rises to 33.95% in May. And that's on page 5, which is making it another 28-year high, if you know what I mean. Move away from that. Now, cholera, 15 dead in Lagos as outbreak on certain unsettles Ogun and Oyo. And you find that story on page 5. Very expensive Eid El Kabir. Only super rich buy, buy as Ram sells for nearly 1 million naira. No. That story is on page 4. Edo 2024, OB launches Akpata's uh, campaign, seeks Oba's mm -hmm. blessing 
for Labour Party's candidate. And that story is on page six. Very interesting what Zoni Vanga does, where they always find this um, models, good-looking women to put on their front page. Fine, interesting. <laughs> yeah, more interesting to me. Um, by the way, about the rams costing one million naira per, per ram. Mm -hmm. So they, coming to work every single day, there are always these bunch, I call them a bunch of rams, about four of them, and the, you know, they always like to lie down on the road. Yeah. So you're telling me that that's four million naira out there on the road. <laughs> just, just lying, just <laughs> lying there. Oh enjoying dear. their life. That's uh, giving me ideas of what to do next time. Yeah, Let's... <laughs> you know you're on national television, I mean, they I can't know. hear you. I just outed myself. Okay. This well, day you. newspaper might be our last one, not too sure, but you're hit with this headline. In Salah message, Tinubu says Nigerians' sacrifices, expectations will not come to naught. So, Atiku Abbas will be governors, APC, PDP, celebrate with Nigerian Muslims, preach peace, love, sacrifice. DSS urges vigilance, IG orders AIGs, CPs to beef up security. And just um, at the top of that one, uh, Tinubu rejoices with Cyril Ramaphosa on re-election as South African president. Congratulations to him. Saw a picture or the video of him getting re-elected and he looked rather, rather decent and happy. Despite Supreme Court judgment, PSC police on fresh coalition course over recruitment of personnel. We talked about the list. And at the top, Finiti steps down as Super Eagles chief coach. It's a big deal, this. Analysts urge FG to subdue rising energy prices, boost FX liquidity. Others, as inflation peaks at 33.95%. We're almost at 40. Let's just say it's 40%. There's no point calling it that. It's, it's already uh, um, um, 40%. That's all for this day newspaper. Are we staring out of Nigeria now, Jude? Oh, what yes, are we doing? indeed. We're going to Sunday Nation on the way in Kenya. There we go. The very first one that comes at you, painful death after botched brain surgery. Very sad indeed. You can find that story on page four and five. Uh, school cook whose score was wrongfully opened up for an operation at Kenyatta National Hospital instead of simple procedure on his arm in 2018, died quietly years later due to complications after losing his job and going through agonizing pain. That is one mistake nobody should have to make. When you go there to the top there, reality check for Chachagua as he stares Yuda rebellion. You can find that story on page eight. Right next to it, Gino Starlet's date with destiny in World Cup bid. You can find that story on page 31. Return of Coffee Theft, you can find that story on page 24 of Sunday Nation. Finance Bill, MPs consider key changes. That story you can find there. I'm sure it's more on, uh, on the finances of Kenya. Uh, at the very bottom there, there's, uh, there's a pretty much more, I think, uh, uh, more interesting stories to find when you go on to the Sunday Nation for, uh, from Kenya. And that's all for the dailies this morning. But coming up, we're going to be taking a look at the editorial cartoons that caught our attention all last week. And of course, this time, Judith is going to be bringing us some of these. So stay tuned. It's Breakfast Extra. So normally I wouldn't be the one standing here, it should be Mazino, but here we go. I'm right here. I'm about to bring you the news strips. She's very excited for news strips, so am I. So I'm going to give you as much energy as I can for news strip. Now basically the news strip segment is where we put out all of the uh, cartoon editorials and you know pictorials uh, that, we, that features on all the major uh, newspapers and dailies in Nigeria. And they are so, you know, so sarcastic, so witty, and very apt when you look at how, you know, they're able to capture the very essence of the major headline stories that we have in Nigeria. So I'm going to pull up some of them for you. Uh, the very first one that we have for today is Business Day. And this one, I like Business Day, right? Um, they always do it well for me. And this comes up right on our screen when you see it. Now, CEO, CEO. And you can see all the stones that are littered at the very top, at the bottom there. If you can pull it up for me, there we go. You can see all the stones that are littered there. And you can see how they are trying so hard to not get 
you know, fall off on those uh, on the on uh, on there. So we have uh, uh, lack of due diligence, high interest rate, poor power supply, taxes, uh, forex scarcity. You know, sliz tax. You can see them. They're CEOs. Uh, we live or we die, and they're all escaping. You know where they're running away from? Nigeria's business environment. And you can see them strapped up, trying to get in, climb the ladder of the helicopter that is jack buying out of Nigeria. The multinationals leaving Nigeria, they can, while everybody else has to stare through all the landmines of doing oh, business in Nigeria. Absolutely. And very difficult. Yeah, and what was interesting is that you actually need them when it comes to you know, to make to, to send the message that your economy is quite viable. Exactly. Move away from Business Day now and now to our very next one. Still on Business Day, if I'm, if I'm correct, but correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, Business Day. God. The next, this one is clearly uh, what we call uh, the bubbles as well as uh, the comic strips where you have strips after strips and the, the, con the conversational bubbles is on it. So the very first one is, I remember the first June 12, we shouted farewell to poverty. And his friends, his accomplice replies and goes, that's why Mr. Presido should get cracking. And then the next one, why? And he goes, so much hunger, banditry, abject poverty, hardship everywhere. And then at the bottom, he goes, so? And his accomplice replies, we no longer shout farewell to poverty. We now shout farewell to our sanity. Well, very self-explanatory there. There's really nothing that you can uh, deny. Uh, one thing is certain. Uh, people are hungry. The price, I mean, l recently we just saw the, the numbers, the inflation number uh, for May. It is at 33.95%, the highest so far in a 28-year uh, uh, protracted period. Uh, price of food have jumped. This Eid is not like the usual Eid that normally would have. It's now been downsized and families have to, you know, struggle or better yet, um, look for a cheaper alternative to be able to celebrate and still stay within the the tenets of their religion. So it's really, really hard uh, for Nigerians. Just a really tough time indeed. But hey, Nigeria will heal the. We move on now to our mm. very next uh, 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 strip for today, away from Business Day. This next one is still also from Business Day. And uh, as you can see, there is our very own, you know who it looks like. There's no need to, to say who it looks <laughs> like, but we know the hat is a big giveaway and the glasses as well. Kind of his signature look, like Mizuno and his uh, monkey jackets. But anyway, um, it's a, it's a, this looks like a, ch a chess board or a checker, a checkers uh, board, right? But I think it's to me, I think it's a chess board, right? Yeah. And instead of the usual uh, uh, statues that you have, like your bishop and your and your queens and your knights and your pawns, what you have is very, 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 very interesting. Um, symbols that represent Lagos State. For example, there is the uh, 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 the uh, National, National Theater. Theater. There's also the airport there. And there's also a housing, the Third Mainland Bridge. And when you look at it, it looks like, you know, it's being ripped apart. Mm -hmm. And there's now the bulldozer that is coming in and with its uh, wrecking ball, wrecking things to make way from, you know the drill, as you know, say yeah, what it is. It, it, funny thing is, I found that very interesting because it, whoever made that cartoon didn't forget to put the demolitions in there. Yeah. You can see that there's the demolitions, the bulldozers and everything, and then the president's saying, I'm still building Lagos. Yeah. But I'm thinking that is this Lagos at this time? Shouldn't it be more than Lagos? Maybe Nigeria at this point. And, but and, yeah, Lagos is still under construction anyway. Exactly. <laughs> but you know what he's building? What? Uh, Lagos Calabar Highway now. Come on now. There, that one. Okay, so I guess it's all of Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a club of highway and the, the bridge. I see that. But anyway, if there's one thing that's for certain, uh, we've always said this, and I'll say this again, I think it's time that we start to decentralize Lagos. Lagos is, um, it's not, I wouldn't say overpopulated, but it's very concentrated, and I think it's about time that we're supposed to share if you're going to decentralize Lagos, or better yet, make it the mega city that you want it to be. The best thing to do is decentralize it and start to move all of these other developments that you're building to other states that really need it. For example, Plateau State. Move away from uh, Business Day to our next one here. Still from Business Day. I see why Mazuno loves them so much. No, no, I think uh, we, we got a couple wrong from before. A couple of them were actually from The Guardian. Uh, the, the penultimate one was from The Guardian. Uh, uh, these are from Business Day. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. So this, this, one, this one here looks like... Wait, too. 
Hang on a second. Is this our, our uncle? Which one? We have so many these days. Ah, uh, God, the <laughs> one you like, your favorite in the As in Asso Rock. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be too definitive because the papers normally aren't absolutely definitive exactly who yeah, they're referring so, to. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. But so it, I, it's the propaganda machine is whirling there. Yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting. So propaganda machine made in Nigeria. Asso Rock, you can tell, is sitting on on a podium there. Asso Rock, and behind it, it's salted. Uh, you can see a shelf there, salted uh, propaganda, fresh propaganda, dry propaganda, sweetened propaganda, powdered, granulated, raw. I mean, what is this? What, what do you think this could most likely mean? Uh, well, now, lately we've been under plenty of uh, information from the presidency, one of which, I'm going to use this very lightly, um, during the uh, October 1st, uh, or rather, June 12th instance where uh, it's the president Dobalid. And this is how he put it himself. That's one of the means, I mean, one of the uh, instances of propaganda from the presidency. So we're just going to leave it at that for short. Mm -hmm. But there are many more that we've heard over the past couple of months regarding the Tinubu administration. It's yeah. an interesting take on it, cartoon-wise. I mean, well, so. Yeah, now that you say it's made perfect sense. I mean, in the last one year, so much has been said. It's almost like they have different WhatsApp groups that they're on, you know? And Galele will come and say something. Bio Nanoga will say a different thing. You know, it's really hard. Which is which, you know? There's mm -hmm. also the situation where uh, the Dubai one, where they announced that the UAE had opened its borders and they were now granting visas. And then the UAE came out and said, oh, no, we never said that we were doing that. You guys are still banned from coming into our country. And then we said, but why did you say that? It was a whole thing during that period. Mm-hmm. Well, hey, you know one thing is for certain, um, uh, and that's the reason why press and media is really, really important to always go ask this question and hold the government accountable. The power of the press really is accountability and all holding power accountable. But that's all we can take on the strips. I do hope you enjoy them. Now remember that if you find anything through the course of the week and you find them in, uh, very interesting, make sure to let us know through our WhatsApp, or rather our, our, our social media channels. We're at New Central TV. This is Breakfast Extra. Coming up next is our big story, and this time is the Game of Thrones or the Tossels uh, in Kano State. Join us again. Welcome back. Now let's take you to Kano, where it's all Game of Thrones, only just last week it was something different. We turn first attention to the situation that has troubled Kano State since the return of the 14th Emir of Kano as the 16th Emir of Kano State um, only a few weeks ago. Now on Friday, Justice Lehman Mohammed of the Federal High Court Kano State declared that the dethroned Emir Aminu Adobairo has the right to be heard. The case filed by the King Aminu Baba Dan Agundi is that of a fundamental human rights case in the Emir tussle, uh, Emirates tussle. The development comes days after a Kano State High Court ordered substituted uh, service on Bayero and four other Emirs in a case filed by the Kano State government to restrain them from parading themselves as Emirs. Now, the judge declared that the act of the Kano governor in directing the police to arrest the applicant without any lawful justification is a threatened breach of the fundamental rights to liberty of the applicant guaranteed under Section 35.1 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as altered. The court last Friday reserved its judgment in the fundamental human rights suit filed by the 15th Emir of Kano, Ado Bayaru. The reservation of judgment was taken by Justice Amu Bada following a heated argument between lawyers. It was learned that the applicant, Ado Bayaro, who was recently dethroned by the state government, filed a motion expertise to restrain his arrest of any kind. So joining us to unpack the increasing complexities of the chieftaincy matters is, of course, uh, a lawyer uh, and uh, well, legal practitioner, uh, Johnson Omede. You're welcome, Johnson. Good to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. All right, great. 
Now, Johnson, first off, let's talk about what the court has just done. It's ordered the state governor, uh, state government, actually. Um, it, they've been fined 10 million naira. I, I'm, I'm very curious as to exactly what the impact of this fine would be um, and also what the, the case would be for the current situation between the emirs, uh, one deposed and the other one reinstated. So tell us exactly what this means or portends. Thank you very much. Um, the case that led to the fine was a judgment released by Honorable Justice S.A. Amobeda. Uh, the applicant in that case was the 15th Emir, His Royal Highness, Alhaji Ado Aminu Bayaro. Uh, that application essentially borders on the bridge of rights uh, that he purports to have now the court has declared that he has which is a right to liberty and a right to a freedom for liberty now there is nothing on the face of that application that touches on the issue of the emirate emirship appointment or uh, 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 removal of emir that case is stricto sensu an enforcement of right in law that the formal emir or the 14th emir has, the 15th emir has. So it has nothing to do with the issue of emir, emirship, appointment, or removal. Now, the court, Federal High Court, under the application that was brought, pursuant to the provision of the Constitution and the Fundamental Enforcement Procedure Rule, held that you cannot, by an order, howsoever constituted, disallow anybody from enjoying his right to liberty. And this came as a consequence of the order made by the governor asking, the, directing the, the security agent, agencies to arrest and detain the, the, the 14th Emir, the 15th Emir, I mean, and he went to court to push for his right. The court, in deciding in his favor, find the governor and all of find the governor and some of the agencies that were involved there, 10 million naira fine for violating his right or about to violate his right, as it were. And so it has nothing to do with the Emirate. The fine, of course, must be paid. It's an order of court and it must be obeyed. However, uh, the, the parties in those suits, particularly the respondent, the federal government was joined using the office of the Attorney General. The state Attorney General was part of it. And then all of the security agencies up to Navy were respondents in that suit. But Johnson... What the court... Um, yes. Uh, now, the, the case is that, first off, there wasn't an arrest. So how come the, the state has been imposed with this 10 million naira fine if they didn't succeed in arresting him in the first place? And then another question is, when exactly did Adobairo file this motion um, uh, against his human... or, or for his uh, rights? Okay, so what happened was the governor gave a directive that Adobairo be arrested and detained. There was a directive from the governor of the state on this matter. Adobairo, having listened to that directive, went for his fundamental right. Now, fundamental right action can come as a result of threatening bridge, threatening bridges. If that breach could may not have occurred, but it, where there is a likelihood of threatening the right of anybody, once you perceive that a right is about to be breached, what you can do is that you are entitled to go to court and enforce your right, either to stop from that, stop that breach, or ask the court to reverse any breach that may have occasioned as a consequence of the action of another. When the governor gave that directive his right to go to court and uh, enforce, his, his right to go to court to enforce the, his power or his, his protection under the constitution was matured. So at the time he filed the suit was when the directive was given. So his suit was, was properly filed and was early in time. Mm. So, I mean, uh, let's look at this because we're a bit pressed for time now. The, the court have now fined uh, the state government now to pay 10 million naira for violating his human rights. How do you foresee this playing out now that it's now in the federal 
uh, the Federal High Court. How do you see this whole case playing out in the next couple of days or weeks to come? Okay. On this issue of enforcement of right, at the level of the Federal High Court, is conclusive. A judgment has been delivered. Parties in that suit, particularly the respondent, the second respondent, which is Kano State Government, represented by the Office of the Attorney General of the State, they have a right in law. Their first right in law is to exhaust their rights of appeal in that suit. Uh, until that appeal is exhausted, assuming they, they elect to go on appeal, until the right of appeal is exhausted and the courts of uh, the court of appeal and the Supreme Court holds that yes, a right was breached and the fine was consistent with what the Federal High Court has done, then the Kano State government must proceed to pay Adobayaro that 10 million. It's an order of court and parties must obey it. There, there's nothing anybody will do about it. But prior to that time, they have a right of appeal both at the Court of Appeal and at the Supreme Court. And I want to believe they will want to exhaust their right in those channels. Now, besides the uh, besides a 10 million naira fine that the government has received, are there any you know legal implications or consequences, potential legal consequences that the, late, the Kano State government uh, might face when it comes to the matter of, of, of uh, reaching uh, the 15th Emir's uh, human rights? No, there are no further consequences on this. Like I said earlier, uh, if there were to be any consequences, would have the issue would have extended beyond just fundamental right. There is a substantive issue, which is the issue of detronment and appointment. That issue not being part of what was submitted to the court for for adjudication under the fundamental enforcement right does not fall under the decision that the court has taken. So it has no further impact outside the fact that the court has found that the right of the 15th Emir was breached. And as such, it was entitled to damage, damage of which is 10 million. Anything outside of this has holds no water, either in Kano State or anywhere in the world. And it has nothing to do with the Emirship tussle or appointment, removal, howsoever constituted. What this has done essentially is that one person has a right to liberty and nobody can take that liberty from him same having been guaranteed under the constitution of the federal republic of nigeria which is the highest law of the land and the court has held as such so no. i don't see any other consequences arising parties are expected to just obey the law and proceed. okay but does the court order extend anywhere into the chieftaincy matters can the um, 14th, um, or rather, can the 15th Emir continue to parade himself as an Emir? Thank you very much. So, uh, as I had earlier said, the application submitted borders essentially on the enforcement of rights to liberty. There is nothing on the face of that application or on the judgment delivered by S.A. Amubeda, Honorable Justice S.A. Amubeda, touching on the issue of the emirate it has nothing to do with who is the emir who is not the emir it has nothing to do whether the 16th emir is actually the emir of kano or the 14th emir can continue to parade himself as emir of kano that judgment has nothing to do with the emirate tussle it touches nothing on that what that judgment did was the enforcement of right and as such, what the Kano state government has done under the power conferred on it by an act of legislature, removing and appointing, is consistent with record. The status quo remains that the 16th Emir remained the Emir, having been duly appointed under the law, enabling the governor to do so. Uh, so there is nothing in the face of the judgment just released as to whether the 14th M the 15th emir can continue to parade himself as emir or not as it is the emir of kano as of today is the 16th emir his royal highness that is the emir of kano so there is nothing on the face of that judgment that i said otherwise so now so just to be clear this is now a closed
case. They don't have any more case. They would not be able to take Kano State government up on the appointment of the 16th Emir. This matter is done. No, no, no. The matter is not done. I will repeat again, permit me. The matter is not done. This particular issue deals with fundamental enforcement. If the 15th Emir feels that an injustice has occasioned as a consequence of his removal, he has the right in law to approach a competent court of jurisdiction to press home his demand. This case is not closed on the issue of the Emirate, but as touching the issue of whether his right was breached or not, that case is closed, and the court has held that his right to liberty is, is guaranteed as provided under the Constitution. But as touching the Emirate, if he feels that, look, uh, you have uh, done injustice to me by removing me as the 15th Emir of Kano, I will press on my demand by approaching a court of law that has jurisdiction to deal on issues that has to do with chieftaincy. In either in Kano state, uh, it can't even do this outside of Kano. The court in Kano must be the court to listen to this suit, particularly mm -hmm. because issues of chieftaincy title over the period has been decided fully, fully by the Supreme Court that as touching matters of chieftaincy, only the court, state court, uh, high court of a state has jurisdiction to decide on issue of chieftaincy matter. Federal mm -hmm. High Court cannot have a power to do so, given its substantive jurisdiction provided under Section 251 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and all other enabling laws provided as, as the act of the Federal High Court and the rules. So right, Federal High Mr. Court Johnson. cannot decide on the Mr. issue of substantive Mr. matter except the State High Court. We are out of time, but first we want to say thank you very much for joining us to discuss this very crucial matter here. We understand better now what exactly is happening in Kano State, and uh, we appreciate your presence here for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And that's Johnson Omede. He is a legal practitioner and expert there, and he joined us to talk on the, uh, the tussle. And so far, the uh, High Court, as it has now uh, ordered uh, Kano State to pay 10 million naira to the 15th Emir, uh, to uh, for him breaching his fundamental human rights. We switch gears now from breakfast to the headlines, and we have Adebola Adeduba on standby. Adebola, very good morning to you. Good morning, Judith and Mazino. Good to be here. Welcome to Breakfast Headlines, CL News, Central Television. I am Adebola Adeduba. As Muslim, Muslims across the nation celebrate Idril Kabiru, prominent leaders, including President Bola Chinobu, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, and several state governors have extended their congratulations and called for unity and sacrifice. In a statement released by President Tinobu's special advisor on media and publicity, Adjurian Galale, the president highlighted the significance of Idil Kabir, describing it as a time of sacrifice, faith, and submission to the will of the Almighty. He emphasized that these values are crucial for nation building, underscoring that collective purpose, determination, and action are necessary to drive sustainable change in the country. And moving on to another story. In the meantime, the Inspector General of Police, Kayo D. Egbertokon, has assured the general public of the Nigeria Police for sustained efforts in tackling crimes and enhancing public safety and security across the country ahead of the Idil Kabir celebration. This assurance comes as the IGP directed Commissioners of Police, along with the Supervisory Assistant Inspectors General of Police, to strategically configure the security architecture in their areas of responsibility for robust and responsive policing. Joy, the Inspector General of Police of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, IGP Kayode Adiolu Egbeto Config Day, NPM has assured the general public of the Nigeria Police for sustained efforts in tackling crimes and enhancing public safety and security across the country. This assurance comes as the Inspector General of Police directed commissioners of police in all the states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, along with their supervisory assistant inspectors general police to strategically configure the security architecture in their areas of responsibility for robust and responsive policing 
ahead of the 2024 Ide Cabri celebrations. The IGP has mandated Zona IIGs and State Command CPs to deploy human and operational assets to conduct confidence building and crime prevention patrols of major highways in residential and industrial areas at vulnerable points, places of worship, other public recreational places, and around all critical national infrastructure. And now to health matters. Nigeria's Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tarid Lagbaja, has underscored the need to improve capacity of the Nigeria Army personnel. This, according to the Army Chief, would also keep personnel and troops abreast of drug abuse and post-traumatic stress disorder management in the Nigerian Army. Our correspondent, Chizoba Anionwe, now reports. According to research, the use and abuse of drugs and alcohol within the military can cause problems in terms of readiness, discipline, mental and physical health of the service personnel. It is on this premise that the Department of Transformation and Innovation of the Nigerian Army converged on the 3rd Armored Division, Maxwell Kobe Cantonment, to sensitize troops on the subject matter. Representing the Chief of Army Staff, the General Officer Commanding 3 Armored Division and Commander Operation Safe Haven says the sensitization on the Nigerian Army lessons learned process, drug abuse, and post-traumatic stress disorder management cannot be overemphasized. The prevailing incidents of drug and substance abuse, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder, amongst our troops deployed in several theaters of operation is quite worrisome and necessitates troops' awareness on the effects as well as the management of drug substance abuse and post-traumatic stress disorder all in the bid to enhance your combat effectiveness. Chief of Army Transformation and Innovation, Major General Zakari Abubakar, represented at the event, maintains that the security and development of any nation largely depends on the training of our security personnel. The highest obligation and privilege of any citizen is that of bearing arms for one's country. This underscores the importance of training and the concern for the well-being of the average soldier. If a soldier is well trained and administered, the army and nation will be better for it. Nigerian army has been able to identify root causes of some problems, hence avoiding a repeat and resulting in improvement and efficiency. Lessons learned basically describes people, things, and activities related to the art of learning from past experiences to achieve improvement. How consistent such programs are organized for all personnel who obviously cannot be accommodated here at once will determine their effectiveness and efficiency on the job. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba and Yowin. Away from that, President Bola Tinubu has approved the appointment of Ayo Dejiario as the Director General of the Bureau of Public Enterprises. The President's spokesperson, Adjurian Galale, made disclosure in a statement on Saturday. According to the statement, he is renowned as a financial expert and a fellow of the Institute of Chatter Chattered Accountant of Nigeria and the Chattered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria. The new DG served as the Commissioner of Finance and Legal State between 2013 and 2015 and was the chairman of the board of the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria. And moving on to another news item, residents of Akonapa 1 community, Karo local government area of Nasara State, North Central Nigeria, have accused the Abuja Electricity Distribution Company of extortion. The allegation is coming after the community claimed it had borrowed about 22 million naira to buy a new transformer after suffering two months without electricity 
and the distribution company did nothing to resolve the issue. The committee says the distribution company is insisting they will be billed for two months. They have been without power and are calling on the Nigeria Electricity Regulatory Commission to call them to order. Our, our constraint, even now, I'm still surprised that the correspondence you sent to AEDC, you don't receive reply to it. I don't know whether they are being uh, skeptical not to commit themselves in writing, which does not help matters. So when we followed it up, uh, we wrote a follow-up letter to that uh, effect, that informing them that the community had decided that since this process is delaying, the community had decided to to buy to buy a new transformer. And then when we buy such transformer, which ordinarily is supposed to be the responsibility, it means they should be able to partner. If they allow us to do it, they should be able to partner with us, at least as a private-private partnership. Because even the one that is bad now is on community effort, not AEDC. And unfortunately, when you get such this thing, they will ask you to donate to AEDC. Your hand is off, you are tied. And then when the old one, they generated 100%, there was no waiver. I had a lot of things in my freezer before the blackout. When the whole thing happened, we were thinking that within days, we will be able to fix the problem. But we were able to fix it for weeks, getting to two months now. All that I had saved money and bought in my freezer, they all got bad. So I had to throw some away and then give some to my dogs. So that really puts in another burden of having to now restock, having to cook every day, looking at even tomatoes, pepper, everything in the market now is very... But if they had been light, I would have saved, knowing that there are some foods that are seasonal that I can actually store in my fridge and use whenever I want it. We've been writing letters to AEDC. Unfortunately, there is no paper reply. Rather, they make a call and tell us we should go and meet the area manager. Area manager is going to attend to us. And many a time we'll go there, we'll, you know, there will not be something substantial. You know what you are expecting where you lay a complaint, expecting a better result. All to no avail. The last letter we wrote was to make a demand that we as a com community, we are buying a transformer. And we want them to give us a soft landing when it comes to billing system. They told us outrightly that whatever we are doing, we are on our own. If we spend whatever money we spend, we are on our own and we have to pay for it. That it does not affect their collection of billing. Then they wait for that to tell us that if the old one is bad, that we should give them time to fix it. We give it them time. They said they are. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to Judith and Mazino. Thank you very much, Ms. Adeduba, for bringing us the news. <laughs> you know, I always love telling your name. Um, so how are you celebrating the holidays? Well, like you know, we're here to for seven media jobs. So I guess pretty that much That is the be best answer because I don't know why I asked that question. <laughs> but that is the best be answer. Work, we're stuck most likely. here. I was hoping for something more colorful, more <laughs> celebratory. You know, come on. Just, you know, at least go see a friend who's got some meat, some ram meat. Well, if, if I happen to be off, maybe I, I could. I could do that. Yeah, Perhaps. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and when you do wine and dine with your friends, do note that whatever you're going to be eating, if it's ram, it's very expensive. It's a million yes. naira, they say, for one ram. But, you know, let this thing go now. Uh, Adibola, I, I, I don't know about you, but the reason why this is on my case is because every morning I see these rams on the road lying down. That's four million naira there, four of them. <laughs> I didn't know before, <laughs> but now I know. Man. I mean, it's one thing to, to, for it to go for one million. It's another thing to find somebody who can afford one million exactly. naira. Uh. So... Uh, if they are later there, mm, I mean, I Nobody was watching. I was you watching. I, mean? a I was watching a report of uh, you know ram sellers on the market complaining mm. about the decline in purchase uh, from mm. customers. Uh, you know, it, it's such a gory sight to behold on how they used to sell much more before now, and now things have just dwindled in terms of sales and purchases from the average Nigerian. Mm. Well, it's sad indeed. Irrespective Nigeria that things are difficult, it's Nigeria still celebration time. So. Issues. Uh, Nigerians will find a way. Let's just Always. Hopefully. Thank you, Adebola. Thank you indeed. You're welcome. And now, still inside of Breakfast Extra, we have our Creative Corner. And inside of Creative Corner today, Adam Songbird is going to be gracing us with, well, some excerpts from inside of his life. He's a prolific music uh, composer and much more. 
But you get to find out if you stick around and watch this. My name is Aluko Oludamilola Adewale. Um, everyone knows me as Adam Songbird. Um, quickly, the name Adam is um, an acronym of my name, Aluko Damilola. So, and the Songbird is a name given to me by fans. <laughs> so yeah, that's my name. I'm from Oshun State, Elisha. Um, I'm a singer, songwriter, musician, designer. Whatever. <laughs> okay. I attended the Keja High School uh, here in Keja and also Federal Polytechnic offer studied computer science and then to Lagos State University computer science. Um, how does it relate to what I do now? I say um, the course that I studied is very flexible, you know. Doing computer science, of course, it means I know a bit of my way around the intricacies of using a computer. So, um, yeah, music has just always been um, a part of me. Um, from the home front, uh, talking about my family and everyone, you know, we've, we've always been music lovers, you know, but I think that in secondary school started translating beyond just loving music to wanting to create music. I started you know, showing a lot of love for creating music. And you know, my let me just start from the home front. My family is a very Jollof family. By Jollof, I mean like we, we have different characters. You know, I grew up with like my uncles and aunts, and they all like different kinds of music. My dad especially loves country music, uh, uh, the likes of Kenny Rogers, Dolly Parton, and, and the rest. And he plays a lot of that, you know, at home. Um, my uncles, one of them is a Bob Marley fella addict. Like, he literally knows their life story from the beginning to the end. And um, that one is more intense for me because he, he's more like the kind of person that forces me to listen to those music and be like, only gone gone, this is, this is the real music, not that one, you know. And I have one that is more of the playful type. He enjoys a lot of the basic way. And sometimes uh, when he's in his body mood, he listens a lot to R. Kelly and like so I'll just say one of the good things that it did for me was to see music from a holistic perspective you know I am not one to stick with genre I like I've I've always never believed in music segmentation like I just believe if, if it sounds good then it's, it's good music if it feels good then it's good, good music so I feel like all those things help me to like see music from like an aerial view, not just from one angle, you know, so it's one of the advantages that I've enjoyed so far. I think in 2009 or 10, yeah, I was working at a studio, not like working, because I was actually working before I left my work to go work there and I wasn't like earning any like monthly salary or anything but of course I enjoyed being in the studio so let's just say I've been a studio rat for a, a long time so while in that time I I would create music for artists that come to the studio and don't have a song they just come there be like just give me beats and then you give them beats and then they, they don't even know what to sing and then so 
I was used to the fact, I was used to like helping them out with their songs. So one time, uh, Mr. Saeed Balogun walked into our studio with some of his you know, guys and they needed my producer at the time to help them edit their dialogue, you know, because they had a lot of noise in dialogue, so they needed a dialogue editor and also someone to just help them. I think they had plans to create music somewhere else. So they came basically to edit their dialogue. And when they walked into the studio, I was working with an artist, you know, who didn't really know what he wanted on that beat. So I was singing on the beat, I was freestyling on the beat. And one of his guys heard me sing. And he just tapped me and said, Boss, she employed in the system me a day in them call. Like, am I playing it on the computer or I'm singing to it? I'm like, no, I'm playing the beat on the computer and I'm singing to it. He was like, yeah. <laughs> so he rushed outside to call Saeed Balogun and then that one walked in. I was like, okay, sorry, sing something on it. So I was singing on the beat and I was like, wow, now you sound really nice. And I thought you know, it was like an already recorded stuff. So he now said, please, can you create something for this film that we came to edit? I'm like, ah, I don't know, talk to my producer. So then I was like, yes, we can totally do it. He was like, if you guys can create something for me, how long will it take? We we're like, maybe by the end of the week. So he was like, just create something for me. So he left. By the next day, because we worked all night, so by the next morning we sent him a song and he was just blown away and started sharing with all other actor friends of his and it just became a thing you know, that time. I think it was 2009 or 2010. And then that was how it happened. We did that film, the next film, the next film, the next film. I just started creating movie soundtracks from there, you know, specifically for him, and then later other people started coming in. The whole deal with Ni Akimolayo like came very differently. Um, my friend Tolu Obaro was uh, working with um, Dr. Bayo at the time. I think they were working on Prophetess and they needed some original songs for the film because the film was um, centered around white garment and then you know sports and all that. So my friend had been working on the film, like creating sounds for the film, but not songs in particular. You know, so when he came to doing songs and he told me the ideas that you know Mr. Nia and Dr. Bayo had, and of course I had white garment background, like I was born in you know, CNS, and of course, you know, maybe later we moved into the Pentecostal church. But of course, I had the whole vibe and the idea about how music is in the white garment. So it was easy for me. So he just told me, he said, Guy, okay, I have this beat and that beat and that beat, and we can have this song and that song and that song on it. Let me see what you can do with it. I want to send it to Dr. Bayo in the morning. And then all night, you know, working from home, I think I was sitting on, on, on his bed while I was recording with the mic in one hand. And then we did like three songs before morning. And then we sent it to Dr. Bayo, sent it to Mr. Lee, and everybody was just crazy about, about the songs. And I think that was what birthed, you know, the relationship between me and Mr. Lee Akimolano and of course my guy to go down. Okay, yeah, so two years after Prophetess, um, so many things have happened, you know, good things, sweet things have happened. And then um, I would say before AMVC, um, I had had a lot of like growth and a lot of um, people paying more attention to what I do. And, you know, AMVC was something that I knew. It was, in, it was inevitable. Of course, we didn't win the category, me and my guy, we didn't win the category, but, but we knew and then we still know that, of course, this, this, this is gonna get bigger than this. Because, of course, we've always worked with like, a big vision you know, in mind. And for us, we just, I concentrated on making sure that the quality of what we are dropping is top notch. And then when it came that we were nominated for uh, King of Thieves, Ageshi Kole, in the original soundtrack um, category, and also um, I think Battle on Booker Street. 
you know, for us it was like, oh yeah, okay, finally, <laughs> finally um, someone sees us and it felt really good. Because let's start from Prophetess, uh, Prophetess, King of Boys to um, Your Excellency, um, King of Thieves, Angeshikoli, uh, Jagun Jagun, Battle on Buka Street. Uh, I can't remember everything. Um, there's some that I didn't actually sing, but I wrote music and supervised music for uh, House of Secrets, Nicolo. The list is endless. Um, all these are great and unique movies in their, you know, in their own right. And I will say it's very hard to pick a favorite, but let me just pick two. I pick Prophetess because Prophetess, you know, brought about a shift, you know, for me and for the entire Antil Studio. It was a shift. Prophetess and. Um, I'd say um, my latest work, or maybe the last you know, work, Jagun Jagun. This is the biggest set ever in Nollywood. Jagun Jagun is exceptional. It's in the world of its own. You wanted to create fantastic violin, something that people can enjoy. Because everything you're going to be seeing in this movie is actually deliberate. This movie is on dread. I'm not capping. And I feel that with the sound, we can take you there. I'm at Ben, you did All right, so um, I have an EP that was released um, two years ago, <laughs> and of course some singles after then. So, but um, this year by December, I'm planning on dropping another five-track EP of um, songs that I like. <laughs> you know, so this time it's not going to be focused on one genre or you know, it's just be, it's just be songs that I like. You know, songs that. I just feel I want to share with people. And it should be in December. There's, there's, in the next few years from now, I think there's, there's a lot more about it. I'm songbird than just writing songs and singing. I, I also intend to expand my scope in sound production and, of course, post production. Um, to the ends of the Nollywood and the Bollywood, and um, so help me God. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Adam Songbird there, very talented music composer, and it's good to see how much he has under his belt. I mean, I didn't know that he made compositions for all of those Nigerian right. movies. It's intelligence. Yeah, talented. and he was also nominated for an AMDCA for original music. I think it was in 2022 or three, if I'm correct. Mm. If I'm correct, it was two-time nominated. So he's done really well for ah, himself. Great. So congratulations well, to him. Well, I'll tell you what, from that, let's move on now into Focus Africa. And today, for Focus Africa, we're going all the way to South Africa. Congratulations to Cyril Ramaphosa, who is now the next new president for South Africa. But it doesn't come without its, uh, well, you know what goes on in some election season. And, of course, we're going to be joined very soon by our South African correspondent, that's Bongani, who will be telling us exactly what's happening in there. So stay tuned. We'll be back after this. Welcome back, and after South Africa we go, where we're going to be joined by our guest, Dr. Hammond, 
who's going to be explaining to us what the situation is with South Africa having elected a new president, or rather the former president as the next president, that's Cyril Ramaphosa, after making alliances with other smaller parties to be able to make their quota to be able to elect. So let's uh, see if we have our guest here with us, Dr. Hammond. We're hoping that you can hear us. Good morning, Dr. Hammond. Good morning to you. Okay, good. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks now, for having me. Now, please, would you give us a cursory overview of exactly what's happened since after uh, Cyril Ramaphosa was elected as president, after the coalitions? Yeah, actually, uh, it's not a coalition. It's more of a, a government of national unity. And um, I think uh, DA, the Democratic Alliance, uh, and the Inkada Freedom Party, actually, and some other smaller parties, about 18 all in all, actually joined together. And uh, uh, now the president is re-elected with 283 votes against uh, Julius Malema's, the economic freedom fighters uh, leader, also got about 44. So uh, um, the president will be sworn in um, at the president by Wednesday in Pretoria. Now, ahead of the Wednesday swearing in, we've seen that Julius, Mal uh, Julius Malema's party, EF EFF, uh, they've all come out and they said that uh, they're not in support of this unity government and that uh, a, a partnership or a, a collaboration with the DA doesn't stand with what uh, they stand for. Um, and also, I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a, a move by him for an impeachment or, or a sort of a move not for him to be sworn, on, sworn in for, for Wednesday. Just give us a bit of update on, on that uh, from Julius Malema's uh, camp. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, historically, the DA is a, a center-right, uh, small uh, capitalistic uh, party uh, as opposed to EFF, which is, which is leftist more of uh, Marxists. Uh, so there are two extremes. That's why the EFF di didn't want actually to join the, in the government of national unity. Uh, so wherever there is DA, then uh, uh, the AAF, the EFF will not join because there are issue of land redistribution without compensation uh, in the uh, political agenda or policy of the EFF. So, but uh, as opposed to the market driven, uh, who believes in free economy, uh, more liberal type of politics, DA. So, that's why the EFF uh, wouldn't join, actually. Uh, the same with MK. MK or Nkonto Wesizwe, Zuma's party also didn't want even to attend in the parliament. So uh, that is uh, the situation. So Dr. Obang Mako, does that mean, I mean, if this government is labeling themselves as a unity government with all of the other, uh, where it's a collaboration with this other uh, stakeholders or political parties, mm -hmm. the DA, Encanta Freedom Party, uh, then what then would you now call it if, if you, you know, Julius Malema and the EFF, who have been on the ground, galvanizing, you know, uh, and also represent a major interest of, of major South Africans, then would, would you describe this as a, as a unity government? Well, uh, there is no other choice. The ANC, ANC got only about 40.6%, so there was no outright majority. Um, they could have formed a coalition with EFF and MK, but uh, MK leader Jacob Zuma actually refused. Uh, he doesn't want the president to be re-elected. That's why he excluded himself, uh, including from the parliament sitting uh, on Friday. So the situation is uh, the ANC didn't have choice. They should form a government in order to form a government, you need 50% or more. So that's why uh, the government didn't have choice. This is the only choice that they have, and that's it. So, and, and, how, often, 
And so if they continue. do not have a choice, you're saying that the ANC doesn't have a choice and it was only a matter of time for, for a unity government to be formed. But how, uh, how, uh, what's, uh, what's the, the consensus like with you know, South Africans? Do they welcome this development with the unity government? Um, uh, do they look forward to another tenor with uh, Sir Ramaphosa at the M of affairs uh, in spite of all of the, uh, the quabbles or the qualms that uh, ANC had to face in the last uh, 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 tenor? There is a mixture of feelings. I mean, there are some people, even within the ANC, who didn't want, actually, to have a, a unity government with DA, but uh, there are some who just accepted it. Also, with the South African public, there is a mixture of feelings. There are people who never actually anticipated to see ANC having uh, some sort of coalition or government of national unity with DA. EFF definitely, uh, or their supporters, MK, also um, didn't want, actually, I, they don't want to see, actually, the DA forming a coalition with the ANC. So there are a mixture of feelings, and uh, there will be some challenges as well, because they have different policies. The ANC believes on black economic empowerment. Uh, the land issue is there, as opposed to the uh, DA, which don't want to see the land to be taken away from uh, the white minority. Uh, there will be some challenges, actually. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting also. The uh, Speaker of the Parliament is from the ANC, Toko Didiza, and the Deputy Speaker, uh, who got also about 273 votes, is from DA, Dr. Anneli Loret. So there, it's interesting times. Interesting, Interesting times things. ahead, indeed. Um, Dr. Hammond, now, unity government is what we call it, but this is an embrace of different political parties with different ethos and different, uh, um, well, unique characteristics to this party, like the DA is totally different from um, the ANC. The ANC being in power since the past 30 years, what implications does it have when it comes to the power dynamics, especially for the ANC having to share, um, in quote, these powers yeah. with these other parties? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we will see the cabinet. Uh, you know, previously, since the ANC had an uh, outright majority, all the cabinet ministers were from the ANC. But now, with the uh, government of national unity, it means all other parties that joined the ANC in forming the government will have a minister and portfolio. So, uh, there will be a mixture of uh, ministers or cabinet members uh, from uh, different parties that formed this uh, government of national unity. So there will be power sharing deal, uh, definitely. And uh, it may uh, create some sort of uh, balance of power between these different political parties. Now, in terms of balance, uh, like uh, like Mizuno just pointed out, there are many different ethos, different ideals. The DA has, uh, what would say, almost white supremacist sort of approach, like you said, uh, right center uh, ideals, and then there's the ANC, right? And you talked about interesting times ahead. Uh, what do you foresee would happen in terms of major uh, uh, political policies and economic policies and also social economic policies that are pressing uh, for South Africa. What do you foresee that happen? How do you foresee out playing that, how it will play out uh, in the future? Well, uh, the, it, it will be very, there will be so much compromise that will be going on. I mean, uh, in terms of historically, uh, the black South Africans are uh, disadvantaged. And uh, there are some uh, of the issues that need to be addressed, like the land issue is very central. And there is also uh, other problems, like unemployment is 33% in the country. And uh, there is issue of crime, corruption, and uh, mismanagement of public funds or embezzlement in uh, various government sectors. So, um, in terms of policy, there should be a lot of compromise that will be 
uh, uh, witness in, in the coming few years. But there is also another election coming, local election, in two years' time. So th that would be also very uh, uh, crucial in, uh, uh, to see what which party actually will win with this the within this government of national unity. So in general, there will be so much compromise, so many debates that will be going on in the parliament because there are so much differences between this, uh, especially DA and the other parties that are more into the leftist uh, ideology. Right. Well, uh, Doctor, we want to say many thanks for coming on. Uh, we look forward to what Wednesday would look like for um, the swearing in, as well as you know, just seeing you know what will, the move would be for EFF and also Ju uh, Julius Malema. But again, we appreciate you for taking out the time this morning to join us on uh, Focus Africa on our show. Thank you so much. And that's Dr. Herman Obang Michael, who's a political analyst, and he joined us uh, on the show today to talk to us about the elections. South Africa ahead of uh, the swearing-in of uh, Syria Mafosa on Wednesday and also the co uh, coalition or unity government unity, as well indeed. as uh, the parliament uh, the parliament which was sworn in on uh, Friday. Well, we'll switch gears now, right? Uh, yes, indeed. We're going to be going to our Abuja correspondent so that we can take a look at exactly what's happening as Muslim faithfuls are celebrating the Id that's today. Um, so let's let's uh, get a feel of exactly what the celebrations are like, especially from our Abuja correspondent. We have Joshua Imarai. He's on yeah, standby. There we go. There we go. Joshua, Joshua how are you doing? A very good morning to you. Uh, eat greetings from Abuja here, Mazino. And, Great. Uh, Judith, of course. Thank you. Yeah, Joshua, I know that the, the, the mood is very celebratory, so to speak, and with everyone in their Eid fits. And they are nice, you know, colorful outfits. Uh, but tell us, you are at the, live at the park in Abuja, uh, ahead of prayers, eat prayers for today to really kick off the celebration, which is going to be a long weekend, by the way. Uh, talk to us, what, what's going on so far? Well, Abuja is, is packed with beautiful abayas and jalabias from Muslim faithful across, across Abuja as they congregated in the national mosques in Abuja. The, the event kick started in a rainy note as uh, the prayers that were supposed to happen in the Eid ground was moved down to the National Mosque. And uh, the, the prayer kick started with um, the chief Imam, Sheikh uh, Megari, leading the prayers. And he urged Muslim faithful around Abuja and the environs to, uh, to um, uphold a spirit of sacrifice, understanding the essence of this very season that uh, uh, the, 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 the the beloved, the beloved one sacrificed a ram in place of his son, and this is this is um, something that is 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 quite understanding in, in, in the current Nigerian state, as uh, everyone is being urged to uphold the spirit of sacrifice. I mean, I can see behind you there; everyone is dressed very it's nicely, very colorful. Very actually. colorful. I, I wish indeed. I was there. <laughs> I, 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 I love what it looks like. I really miss the North for for when it comes to Eid celebrations. The fit is always impeccable. But, you know, speaking of, you know, uh, you know, the past and also present and sacrifice, we know that there's so much going on economically, you know, in our it's tough times, the prices of food is high. And I know we've seen news, uh, headline news of the prices of ram as well. Uh, but how is the celebration like? Is it different from past years? Is it, are people still trying, it, you know, and making sacrifices when it comes to their pockets and just to make sure that today happens? I can say for sure to you is that Nigerians are not are not reducing the standard when it comes to celebration. Uh, I, when you go across the street of Abuja, you could perceive the uh, the aroma of of ram being slaughtered and roasted on the fire. It shows you that Nigerians are not relenting. Particularly, Muslim faithful are not relenting to celebrate this period of Eid Kabir, and they are, they they are going all out. Considering the economic situation of Nigeria. Considering the current realities of Nigeria, I don't see that. I don't think they, they are seeing that as a deterrent to stop them from celebrating. They are in, a, they are in an ever happy mode in, uh, in Abuja here. And I can tell you for sure that considering the current realities of the market, considering co the economic challenges, Nigerians here in Abuja are not relenting. They are not stopping. The celebration is packed and everyone is coming out beautiful and ready for the Eid celebration.
Oh, we're stuck in here, so we are not sure exactly what it's like out there in Lagos, but we're definitely going to go out and check ourselves. But um, I don't know, Joshua, if you can do us a favor. If there's anybody around there, any uh, uh, buddy celebrating the Eid around there that you could call on camera, and we could ask them specifically or, or individually um, how they foresee their Eid going, that would really appreciate that. Uh, I'm only asking this because <laughs> I, I want to get a, I want to get individuals who are you know, celebrating to actually tell yeah. us whether there's a difference, a marked difference between this year and last year. Also, uh, well, you know me, I'm a fashion head, so I want to look at their looks as well. Yeah, their we also want to well. see all of that. <laughs> I want to see their fits as well. The, the fits how, how nicely they're looking, you know, the fits. So, so we're hoping, Joshua. We're hoping Joshua would be able to get someone on camera so we can talk to them or at least if he can ask them exactly. Joshua, do you have somebody now? Do you have anybody now that we could talk to? We are trying to work towards getting somebody. Okay. We are speaking to persons now. Okay, that's great. So let's talk security. Now, Abuja is, of course, you know, the center of Nigeria, and I mean that not just geographically, but since it's also the um, um, helm of affairs, where the helm of affairs are. When it comes to security, uh, what's it like there, um, especially that the presidency has asked all agencies to make sure that there's a secure celebration this year? Are people confident? Uh, we understand that the current security challenges of the country now. And I, one thing that I know for sure is uh, that Abuja is, is secure. We are um, coming into the entrance of the Abuja Mosque today. I, one thing that, that was worth noting is that the presence of heavy security men. We could see the heavy security presence in Abuja here. And uh, what welcomed us into this mosque is uh, a very, very huge uh, armored tank standing with stand, standby, standby to take every security measures. Now, and gaining entrance into the mosque, uh, we, we met quite uh, an amount of security persons who were making checks to ensure that um, no other persons who are here with um, ulterior motives gain access into the National Mosque. And uh, uh, across Abuja and the Everon, from the airport road down to the city centre, we could see security men stationed. We could see race, road safety men stationed. Um, not, notwithstanding the part of traffic also, I think precautionary measures have been put in place to ensure that the, the celebration is experienced with a smooth flow. Speaking of traffic, by the way, um, we also know that there have been traffic interstate, interstate between Kaduna and Abuja. Can you speak on that as well? Uh, did you meet people who were traveling into town to celebrate or traveling in or out of the, uh, the state to celebrate? Morning, uh, the, the passage of vehicles into the city center was, I think it was scarce. The, the vehicles that gained access into the uh, city center, they were limited. I, 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 I think it is basically because of some of them are finding um, their way with their legs down to the eat ground. But unfortunately, the rain hampered these plants and we could see an amount of them turning, in, turning down to the city center, particularly the Abuja Mosque, to say their prayers. Uh, you know, it, um, one thing I understand today is that as many Muslim faithful who saw their counterpart or coalists coming down to the um, Abuja Central Mosque, they, they helped some of them and some of them conveyed some of them here to this venue. So the, the traffic situation in Abuja is not, that, uh, is not that heavy, as I would say, it's not heavy. We are experiencing smooth flows of vehicles through and forth to the city center. Oh, nice one, Joshua. I appreciate you for doing that. I, I could keep watching it just to look at all the activities at the I'm back behind. there, from people carrying their balloons and, you know, families with their children. I just love everyday life in Nigeria and, and people watching. And, but again, M Joshua, many thanks. Thank I know you, that uh, later on you'll be stuffing your face with uh, salad meat. I know that I am envious of you. Thank you very much, Joshua. The most. That is the most. <laughs> All right, now let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we've got more and one more big story coming your way. We've still got that issue that happened inside of uh, Joss and the new central town hall, which we'll be visiting inside of our next hour. Stay tuned. Welcome to Sports Update on Breakfast Extra. I am Favor Ito. We'll begin with football stories. And of course, from home in Nigeria, where in the March Day 37 fixture in the Nigeria Premier Football League, Rivers United put six goals past Gombe United. Goals from Shedrak, Asiebo in the 10th and 40th minute, Kazi Einaya 50th, and Nima Wango of 63rd minute. Seifa Jackson 82nd and 88th minute ensured a comprehensive victory for the former league champions. Meanwhile, in Lafia, Lobby Stars came from a 2-0 down to beat Kwara United four goals to three. 
the Harmony Warrior Boys raced uh, to a two-goal lead through Emmanuel Obole and Antonio Omaka before Wahid Adebayo and Francis Odinaka equalized. Before 25 minutes, Galba Abubakar made it 2-3 to Kwara United in the 58 minutes before also Alao Dambani and Kumaga Sol won it for the host. Interesting one, of course, in the MPFL. We still have more match days to see today as the league gradually goes down uh, to the wire. Still talking football, Rashidat Ajibade scored a crucial goal to help Atletico Madrid secure a 1-0 victory over Villarreal in their final match of the 2023-24 Spanish women's top flight season, clinching a place in the next season's UEFA Women's Champions League on Saturday. Interestingly, Atletico Madrid holding a one-point lead in third place ahead of Levante UD needed a win to secure the last Champions League sport from Spain. The Nigerian forward was relentless, consi consistently created opportunities from the right wing through her teammates. We are unable to convert her crosses into goals. Her persistence paid off in the 75 minutes when she capitalized on the free kick, scoring the match's only goal after Villarreal's defense failed to clear the set piece. Congratulations to uh, Rashidat Ajibade, a lady who has been consistent in the Spanish league and now they are currently, of course, uh, in the Champions League sport for next season. And out to the world of athletics, Ferdinand Omayala of Kenya set a world leading 9.79 seconds at the Olympic trials held at the Nyayo National Stadium in Nairobi, Kenya on Saturday afternoon. Omayala secured the sport in the lineup for the upcoming Paris Olympics, reinforcing his status as a formidable contender on the global stage. This season, Omayala has strategically managed his races, aiming to avoid picking too early. Prior to his standout performance at the Kenyan trials, he had achieved another sub-10 seconds uh, at the Prefontaine Perf uh, Perf Classic in Oregon, finishing second to American sprinter Christian Coleman with a time of 9.98 seconds. Now, with the qualification secured, Omayala now looks ahead to the Paris Olympics, which has set to commence, of course, in late July. It will be an interesting one for athletes uh, in the short distance race of Ayala. We have, uh, of course, not forgetting Christian Koba in that particular one. Noah Lyons is also there competing. And not uh, forgetting, uh, of course, uh, the South African, who will be bringing a lot of things uh, to the party. So it's all to fight for when the Olympics starts, of course, uh, in the summer. And out to football, Barcelona young star Lamin Yamal became the youngest man to play at the European Championship as he played a key role in Spain's vibrant 3-0 win against Croatia on Saturday. Now, the 16-year-old Yamal was against Real Madrid's 38-year-old Luka Modric, who was 21 when Yamal was born and had just won his second Croatian title and had made 14 appearances for Croatia. Yamal beats the record previously held by Kaspar Kozłowski, uh, who featured for Poland against Spain at uh, the age of 17 years and 246 days, and Jude Bellingham, who played for England against Croatia at the age of 17 and uh, 349 days. Interesting one for Lamin Yamal. I mean, fantastic tournament he's having so far. Good start for Spain. I will wait to see how much of uh, you know, impact he will make in the Spanish squad as they look forward to win the Euros again after doing that in 2012. And that wraps it up on Sports Update on Breakfast Extra. I am favor you to we'll go on a quick break. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines. I am Adibola Adidiba. As Muslims across the nation celebrate Idil Kabir, prominent leaders including President Bola Chinobu, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, and several state governors have extended their congratulations and called for unity and sacrifice. In a statement released by President Chinobu's special advisor on media and publicity, Ajuri Ngalale, the president highlighted the significance of Idil Kabir, describing it as a time of sacrifice, faith, and submission to the will of the Almighty. He emphasized that these values are crucial for nation building, underscoring the collective purpose, determination, and action necessary to drive substantial change in the country. In the meantime, the Inspector General of Police, Kayode Egbetokun, has assured the general public of the Nigeria Police for sustained efforts in tackling crimes and enhancing public safety and security across the country ahead of the Idil Kabir celebration. This assurance comes as the IGP directed commissioners of police, along with the supervisory assistant inspectors general at the police, 
to strategically configure the security architecture in their areas of responsibility for robust and responsive policing. The Inspector General of Police of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, IGP, Kayode Adiolueguetu Kumpigde, NPM has assured the general public of the Nigeria Police Force sustained efforts in tackling crimes and enhancing public safety and security across the country. This assurance comes as the Inspector General of Police directed commissioners of police in all the states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, along with their supervisory assistant inspectors general police to strategically configure the security architecture in their areas of responsibility for robust and responsive policing ahead of the 2024 Ide Cabri celebrations. The IGP has mandated zona IGs and state command CPs to deploy human and operational assets to conduct confidence building and crime prevention patrols of major highways in residential and industrial areas at vulnerable points, places of worship, other public recreational places, and around all critical national infrastructure. Away from that, President Bola Chinubu has approved the appointment of Ayode Giariyo Beleyi as the Director General of the Bureau of Public Enterprises. The president spokesman at Jiren Galale made this known in a statement on Saturday. According to the statement, Belei is a renowned financial expert and a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria and the Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria. The new DG served as the Commissioner of Finance and Legal States between 2013 to 2015 and was the chairman of the board of the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria. News continues in West Africa, where flooding and landslides have killed eight people in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire's biggest city, after heavy downpour. According to an update report published by the fire service on Saturday, the fire brigade said 18 people were evacuated to hospitals. Roads were cut off as rain fell on Thursday afternoon in most areas of the city, with a population of 6 million people. The torrential rain that fell from Thursday afternoon to Saturday morning was around four times heavier than normal. The National Meteorological Service, Soxtesam, said about a quarter of the precipitation expected over the May, June, July raining season fell in just 24 hours. And we head to South Africa where President Ramaphosa re-elected for a second term after his weakened ANC lost its outright majority, will announce an inclusive cabinet. The ANC said Ramaphosa will lead what he calls a government of national unity, will announce an inclusive cabinet after the May 29 general election produced no outright winner. Congratulatory messages continued to pour in for the leader who was re-elected as president on Friday and will be inaugurated on June, on June 19th. The National Unity Government includes the Center Right Democratic Alliance, DA, the Zulu Nationalists and Katha Freedom Party, and other smaller groups. A roadside bomb planted by jihadist group Al Shabaab has killed at least six soldiers, including a senior military commander in southern Somalia, with several others wounded. The blast occurred during a routine military operation near Govgadon town, some 30 kilometers from the southwestern city of Baidoa. Al Shabaab, an Al Qaeda affiliated group, has claimed responsibility for the attack. Bombing and other attacks are common in the capital, Mogadishu. Mogadishu and Balda, although few have been recorded in recent months. And that's all on the news. It's back to Judith and Mazino. But first, let's take a short break. Stay with us. And we are thrilled to be bringing you this very awe-inspiring and also very motivating group of young women here with us inside of the studio. They are called the Eagle Dancers, and there's six of them. But from what I hear, <laughs> there's more of them we're not seeing. However, they've been competing for, well, over the past 10 years and recording plenty of wins when it comes to dancing here in Nigeria and outside, of course. And only last year, they won the Munster competition uh, where they came first place from a group of 16 dancers and they represented the they were the only groups representing an all or presenting an all-female um, group 
and they won this year once again. They've done the same thing, only maybe not quite as much. Um, just yesterday, they came second at the same competition. Ladies, you are welcome. From Thank Patience, you. Anna, Grace and Grace, Lonne, and Adrian. Adrian, Adrian. Andrea. Andrea. Andrea, there we I go. I tried. Yeah, yeah, you did. You were close. Well, Welcome, congratulations, ladies. ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, my goodness. I should roll at Champions by the Queen, yeah. by, yeah. By, by, queen by the band of Queen. <laughs> Don't let them start singing. Are... They can sing. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. So we have a multi-talented group here. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. I love your hair colors there. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. So tell us about Eagle Dancers. Uh, first off, you are the lead. For the team and you've been doing this for how long talk to us about how being female has actually been maybe a challenge or an opportunity for you setting up this group of people okay my name is patience Ebute. you already introduced me and i'm a dancer choreographer and community organizer from just northern nigeria and i have been dancing for 15 years now as a solo i was dancing for five years and then after that a decade ago we started as a team and we are now a whole community of young women from the north that are keeping it real in the dance industry, continuously organizing shows and coming out for competitions, being on every media platform as much as we can. Um, it's been amazing and a blessing to be a woman in this male dominated industry where you have most male crews than female crews. And that's the inspiration to have a group of women step it out and say, okay, we have greatness in the inside of us. We're going to bring our feminine power. We're going to bring our every energy that we feel in the inside on the dance floor to use movements to make statements, to communicate. And it's amazing to share this space with women because it is different. <laughs> and every time we come on stage, it's like, okay, it's girls, they're strong, they're powerful, and it's normally stands out and that has been the narrative for for a while now especially with the monster which is like a major win you know to have 16 crews that are all female and we have to battle it all male, all male yeah. and then we're the only female and we have to battle it out and then win and come out winners and even yesterday where we had the second um battle we were still second runner of like we're close we're very close to taking it and they're like if you don't, if you play, they are going to take it again <laughs> and take it back to the north. And it was a real tough one. But it's, it's very, very amazing for us to share that space, that moment, every time we come on stage. It's not just about winning, but about coming together and doing something very different. So When I heard yeah. you say 15 years in dancing, I was like, wow, that is, that is courage. <laughs> because as a woman, it, there's yeah. so many expectations from you as a society. Right. Talk to me about those challenges and what the expectations were. Was it easy to just start up and tell you know, family and friends that, you know, I'm just going to be dancing? And was it easy for, for the rest of you ladies here? It's not easy at all to come out to say you want to be a dancer, not just a dancer, a female dancer, not just a female dancer, a female dancer from the north. You can be in Lagos and wear anything you want to wear, maybe just few stereotypes, but in north, you're supposed to be all covered, you're supposed to be decent, you're supposed to be quiet, and now you have wild hairs, you have tattoos, you have to come back home late at night sometimes, you have to, it's a lot of challenge to explain to community, to explain to family that this is the path that we have chosen. But they said the result terminates insult. So mm. so we'll be, the results you've we'll been be, giving. We'll be <laughs> producing <laughs> results. And then how, how, how did that result uh, manifest when you guys went back with the trophy to the north? What did people say after they seen your achievement? You know, what is special about um, women dominating in a man's world is it takes a lot of fearlessness, it takes a lot of resilience, it takes a lot of courage to be able to dominate in a man's world. So when we, when we won the competition and the fact that we are all ladies, when we came back home, it was, everybody received it and it changed the narrative. So it was no longer, we we're, were no longer seen as just dancers or just talks. It was now accepted, dance was now ac accepted as Business mm. is now business because we won a lot of money mm. and we went home. So dance is no longer just, um, it's no longer seen as just 
It was serious business. It, yes. It is, it, it, now, it is now business. dance is serious business. No, and okay. then we have kids now yeah. that come to the studio to want to learn. to learn. People trust us with their children ah. to say, teach us, teach my, our children how to dance so they can be stars like you, they can travel like you. For, for us, it's really a change because 10 years ago, there was just so much attack on, on us. But right now, the community is saying, you can have our kids. Yeah, the, the trust is there to see it as a positive thing. And yeah, so that's, that's really very key for us. Right. Talk to me about your, your process, your inspirational process. What inspires you for every dance routine? Is it the music? Is it your everyday life? Is it the life living in Plateau and Joss and all of the issues that, you know, the communities there, the people they have to face from insecurity? Uh, likewise, what inspires everything? For us, what inspires us first is ourselves to do better by ourselves, to attain our own highest level of creativity. And we really want to tap that inner um, desire to say something, not just really with your words, but with your body. So we are constantly on a journey of using our bodies to communicate. That is a major inspiration. But also like a lot of things that are happening around us, there are a lot of insecurities there's a lot of religious issues. There are a lot of, um, um, what's it called, uh, um, the killings and everything that is happening around us. We use all of that energy to, to create, to suggest a kind of future that we imagine. We imagine a better future, and there is no any other means of stating that future except to use dance, which is what we know the most. So we speak about the killings, we speak about rape issues, we speak about um, insecurities among young girls. We speak about a whole lot of issues that we feel we have direct um, contact with, mm -hmm. mostly from our communities. But also, like generally, looking at dance, the industry itself, how can dance be perceived differently? We are constantly working also to change the narrative, which is a major inspiration to say, those who have the energy to move, those who are moving this way, those who are making statements are not thugs, they are not prostitutes, they are not just because they are ladies dancing doesn't mean they are. And we are looking for wisdom on how to continue to project dance as a positive thing and also something that should be embraced by the community as a means of change. So if this is a message or a way of actually passing across message, like you said, that it's actually impacted your community and people are entrusting you with their children, that means they're seeing the positivity it's making. Absolutely. That must mean that it's a good medium to pass across other kinds of message, killings inside of Jaws or Plato itself. Right. Um, where has this taken you to with this message? What countries have you been able to express these messages at? I, I want to know the places and how far reaching your skill has taken you and that message. Over the years, I never thought I would be where I am. I never thought the group would be where it is right now. There's just so much achievement that has happened in the last five years. We have been able to travel to at least 42 countries. How many? 42 countries. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What? 42 or yes. 42? I thought 42. I'm, I was wondering why she's counting backwards. 42, why not 2 to 4? Oh, you're saying 42. That's yes. Four tens and a two. Mizuno, can you see you? Mizuno is so... Why are like we here? Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> Mizuno is I, so jealous. He is, he is so jealous because he loves to travel as well. So here, that's why he paused. Right yeah. now, we're at 42. Yes, right? 42. Germany, 42. France, Switzerland, so Canada. So imagine the amount of people you've reached Italy, with that message. You know, we had some senior... Senior... Um, leaders in the dance industry, like Kudus Onikeku, who has contributed so much to my journey personally into seeing all of these amazing beautiful spaces outside of Europe, US, Canada and a few of those places and it is dance. Now you say you you've know. been doing this for 15 years. Yeah, 15 Last years. Last five years have been astronomical. Last five you've years. been doing Anna, you've been doing this for how long now? 10 years. 10 years. Ten years. And you're both sisters by the way. Yes. Am I correct? Yes. So we'll come back and talk about the family dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> ah, two of my daughters. Oh wait. Uh, Grace, Grace, you've been doing this for how long? Five. How long? Two, three, four years? Two. Two three. years. I'm just trying to find out how many years, everybody. You've been doing it for how long? What? Ten, seven ten years in the uh, London. She's London. been with me for ten, ten years. She's been with me for ten, <laughs> wow. ten years. And Adriana, you've been three years. Three years. Three three years. years. So clearly, you guys started at a young age. Yeah. Right. Very yes. young. But I, I, one in starting this journey for every single one, ten years, two years, five years, fifteen years. Share with me one defining moment 
that you sat down, one, just one, tell me a story, a moment that you said to yourself, this is it, I'm never going back. It was when we, we got our piece, Aleku, we created a piece called Aleku, yeah. and Aleku is about the female ritual practices that are happening in the in Benue State. They call it it's a ritual practice around women, and it's not just so a positive one. So we, we were researching on that. We traveled to the community, watch how some of these practices are carried out, and we thought of okay, why don't we make this a piece and see where it goes? And boom, we got the opportunity to show that in France. That was the first, I, I have been touring and dancing with different communities, but I, I was working with a lot of women and I needed the world to see them, but I didn't know how. When that opportunity came through Afropolis, I was like, let's go for it. And that moment where we are on that stage, we've been dancing for a while, we've been hoping to be on a global stage. The moment we went there and we did that, we were like, yes! We are supposed to do this. We should keep doing this. And it was a defining moment for us in our career. Precious. Well done. Uh, and also, Grace and every single one of you sitting down here, congratulations. Mazino is going to go home and cry into his pillow. No, no. Ah! It's, okay. it's okay. Thank you very much, ladies. And uh, you guys are going back to Joss uh, today, uh, which is very interesting because we have a very interesting story about our uh, Joss Town Hall, which held on Thursday. Um, trying to find a solution to everything that's happening. And that's coming up next. But thank you very much, ladies. ladies and we hope well plenty done. more well wins, done. plenty thank more endeavors, so plenty more countries. Take me with you. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> thank and, uh, you. Congratulations too. once again. Thank, thank you ladies. so much. Ladies. Thank you. Well to you out there, please stay tuned. We're still coming with that final story. In fact, let's already go to yes, our yes, correspondent we... who is inside of Plato State as we speak. Yeah, and that's we... Anyanwe. Mm -hmm. uh, Onna is on standby, a correspondent who is live in Plateau to give us updates as our a town hall meeting was held over the week. Our town hall meeting was on security and uh, the lives uh, in uh, Joss Plateau. Uh, Chirima, are you there? Oh, rather, I'm sorry, uh, I just, let me correct that. It's on the Sala Eid celebrations. Uh, Chirima, hi, how are you doing? I am good. How are you? Good morning. Good morning to you. You look very good in your Eid fit, by the way. You're going to give me that scarf Thank later. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I see, that, I see that we have uh, some guests behind you. Uh, they're also looking yeah, we fly do. as well in their, in their Eid fit. But talk to me, what's going on where you are at uh, for Salah celebrations? All right, we are here at the Fiber Mosque, the Joss Fiber Mosque. And this is one of the biggest mosques in town. And of course, it's for people actually for the Muslim faithful to celebrate one of the major events they have according to their religious rights. And catching up with a few of them here, they can't wait to express their joy. They can't wait to express how happy they feel being alive, being healthy to celebrate this event. And so um, the Salah worship uh, service had ended like over two hours ago, but they are still around taking pictures, um, felicitating with friends, with well-wishers, and of course, fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. So we caught up with them, and they can't wait, of course, to tell you one or two things about this celebration. So we have them now. Okay, so Hello. tell us, just come over. Uh, yeah, one Hello. at a time. Absolutely. All right, so how do you feel about this? Uh, look to the camera and tell the world. The Salah was funny and was good and nice. That's how we want it. It comes out the way we want it. Yeah. So we are feeling it so much. We are taking a pictures. We are doing everything we are, we are supposed to do. And everything was good and nice. That's why. Thank you very much. Okay, so tell us. Um, I am in particular interested, uh, particularly interested um, about the RAM. So where are we going for this? Yeah. Those rounds, we are starting those rounds to reflect the, to reflect the willingness of prophets, prophets, Ryan, for sacrificing his son, for God's sake, for sacrificing his son and his wife. Now, what does this sacrifice mean to you? That sacrifice is Ibadah. We call it Ibadah. Okay. And it's Sunni, it's Sunna. Okay. So everyone that has the ability has to do it because it's the right time to show love, more giveaways, 
and so on. Thank you very much. Okay, so come over, tell us, um, what do you think people should go home with after today's celebration? Is it just about the celebration and then it's gone? What else do people need to know about the celebration? So we are really happy. And we all wish our brothers and sisters for the salvation. I wish all of us um, peace and prosperity and more happiness. And we are wishing all our family and friends for the salvation of it to greet everyone. So all right thank you guys so you have heard it from them um they can't wait to leave here go back home and continue with the celebration let me also tell you that the the, the town of jaws the city of jaws in plateau state which is the state capital has been so peaceful very very peaceful um unfortunately you can see away from here that we have seen patrol vehicles from different security agencies to ensure there is no breakdown of law and order I'd so like for you to ask them about, you know, how they're feeling. You know, it's been very rough and uh, the news has been that the prices of ram and even livestock have skyrocketed uh, in the last uh, one year. And whether they are going to be, you know, tightening in on their, on their budget for, the, for this year's celebration. Well, um, off camera, we spoke about that and they were like, it, it, it hasn't been easy, actually, the economic meltdown in the whole country, not just in just everybody is feeling it wherever they are. So they are not so happy about that. But for the gift of life, for the sake that they are healthy, I mean, it means everything to them. And then whatever little they have, they have it, they enjoy it with their friends and family members and then move on with life. Well. Well, Chilima, many thanks. We appreciate you for doing this with us. And uh, I can see that your, your fit there is uh, it's, uh, immaculate. I would, uh, I'm going to take your scarf after this. I just need to book my plane <laughs> That's ticket. not a problem. <laughs> Thank you, Chilima. Uh, you're welcome. And now, let's move on to, well, the man of the moment. Sorry, not the man of the moment. I beg right. you. <laughs> let's move on now to something that everybody's celebrating today. Along with the Eid, it's also Father's Day. Oh, yes, indeed. Now, this is a tribute to fathers as we celebrate the unsung heroes on Father's Day. Today, inside of our Weekend Warrior segment. Uh -huh. Today, we pause to pay tributes to fathers around the world on this very special Father's Day. Fathers are the unsung heroes whose tireless efforts often go unnoticed but are felt in every corner of their family lives. To the fathers who work day and night, often in far off places, sacrificing their own comfort and presence in the lives of their families to ensure they do not suffer, your efforts do not go unnoticed. We want you to know your relentless pursuits to provide, even at the risk of being underappreciated, is a testament to your unwavering love and commitment. Ah, yes, indeed. Many fathers and your great hardships, by the way, working in environments far removed from the want and, of course, comfort of their homes. They brave harsh conditions as well, long hours and the emotional toil of being away from their loved ones, all in the name of providing a better life. Now, these fathers often miss out on the small everyday moments. Uh, for example, the first steps, the school plays, the bedtime stories that are so precious to family life, yet they persevere driven by a profound sense of duty and love. So let's consider the fathers who work on oil rigs in distant mines as well, or on overseas production or construction projects. These men endure long periods of isolation, often in dangerous and grueling conditions, and their physical and, of course, their emotional stamina are tested daily. Yet they press on, motivated by the vision of a secure, and prosperous future for their families. Now, these sacrifices are a testament to their strength as well and dedication, and they deserve our deepest respect and gratitude as well. So, we are also going to honor the fathers who have succeeded in raising children with strong character, which is really good, as well as good morals. These fathers instill values such as integrity, respect, and responsibility and their children, laying the foundation for their future success and happiness as well. Now, through their guidance, discipline, and love, these fathers shape their children 
into upstanding members of society. Fathers teach by example, demonstrating the importance of hard work, honesty and compassion. They're role models showing their children how to navigate life's challenges with courage and grace. The lessons learned from these fathers resonate throughout their child, uh, children's lives, influencing their decisions and actions long after they have left the nest. Now, as we celebrate Mental Health Month as well, especially from June 10 to 16, we also recognize the immense mental strain that fathers often endure. The burdens of responsibility, the pressures of providing, and the challenges of balancing work and family life can take a heavy toll. Fathers are expected to be strong, reliable, and unflinching in the face of adversity, but this expectation can lead to significant stress and also mental health challenges. Now, many fathers suffer in silence, reluctance to share their struggles for fear of appearing weak or inadequate. This stoic facade can exacerbate feelings of isolation and anxiety, making it even more challenging to, uh, to seek help. It is crucial, however, that we acknowledge these challenges and encourage open conversation about mental health, especially for men, especially for fathers. Mm. Now, fathers, you deserve to be praised for your resilience and strength in navigating these challenges. Your mental well-being is just as important as your physical well-being and health as well. So taking care of yourself is vital for your family's well-being as well. So we urge you to seek support when needed and to know that asking for help is a sign of strength not weakness, all right? And we also beseech mothers to take extra care of their husbands today, showing empathy and appreciation for all they go through, acknowledge the unseen battles, the fight, and the silent burdens they carry, express your gratitude for their hard work and dedication, and let them feel the love and support they so richly deserve. Simple gestures of appreciation, whether it's a heartfelt note, a warm meal, or a moment of undivided attention, you know how men love those, can make a world a diff of a difference, you know. So celebrate your husbands, all right? Contributions, uh, celebrate their contributions and remind him that his efforts are valued and cherished. Your support and understanding are essential in helping him navigate the challenges he faces, all right? So to all fathers, we award you the Weekend Warrior status of the weekend show of this weekend. So your perseverance through adversities, especially here in our beloved country, Nigeria, is nothing short of he heroic, he heroic, there we go. The economic challenges, uh, political instability, and social pressures that many Nigerian fathers faces, uh, they face make their sacrifices even more significant yet you continue to push further uh, forward driven by love and the desire to create a better future for your families yes on behalf of all men i would like to say thank you and we you. accept I beg you. thank you we accept mothers please take care of us I beg you. today extra we deserve it and to all fathers out there congratulations son well Making the world a better place, one individual at a time. Indeed, thank you very oh, much. Yes, I'm a, I'm a daddy's girl, so um, happy, mm -hmm. happy Father's Day, Father. <laughs> okay, then. Now, it's been uh, quite a very interesting um, show here today. We're going to go on a very short break and then bring you our very, uh, very last bit here on B uh, Breakfast Extra. Why am I stuttering? Oh, I'm overwhelmed the by the congratulations it's for Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be bringing you that in just a bit. Do stay tuned. Last Thursday, the new Central Special Town Hall series took things a notch higher as we facilitated a live town hall broadcast to address the growing concerns of violence and ethnic conflicts in Plateau State, North Central Nigeria. Now, for over 20 years, the conflict in Plateau State has claimed the lives of thousands across several local government areas, including Bokos, Mangu, Riwam, Wase, both Barki, Ladi, and more. The crisis has escalated over the past decade, leaving residents and indigenous in a heightened state of fear, state of emergency. Now, the town hall brought together community leaders, residents, members of various communities, representatives of security agencies, and more to share their experiences, concerns, and solutions 
towards addressing the root causes of the violence and conflicts in the state. Now the event was held in Jos, that's the state capital, with the discussion moderated by New Central's Ben Adakede, seasoned journalist and expert in conflict reportage. Notable remarks from the town hall revealed the root of the strife across communities and the level of division that Plato had experienced. Um, we are now joined by, uh, with uh, Garba Abdullahi Mohammed, who was also present and who would be telling us well, what he got from inside of the town hall and after that what had happened. Garba, good to have you on Breakfast Extra. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good. Now, Garpa, could you please share with us some of the key highlights that you took away from the town hall, uh, especially regarding the situation, uh, the conflicts inside of Plato State? Okay, thank you very much. And I must commend New Central for putting up such a program, which is timely, that brought all the warring parties under one roof, like the memory length and what happened and what is the state of affairs today. And we are very happy that people express their feelings on what happened and they prefer solutions and ways forward. What I learned more especially from that uh, meeting was, one, that most uh, some people are yet to understand the meaning of peace. And some understood the meaning of peace, and we need to do more on keeping peace, more especially on the flag of having uh, spent more than two decades inside uh, war, war situations, which is uncalled uh, for. So, and uh, people express their feelings afterwards, the call for forgiveness, which is the key for every uh, peaceful process. Now, uh, we, we can't seem to see your, we can't play your visuals of you there because uh, your camera is sort of, uh, it's, uh, we, can't, we can't see your head. So if there's any way you can help us in adjusting your camera as I'll ask you the next question, uh, which is about, you know, the way forward. You, you said that, um, you, you just alluded that uh, one of your key takeaway was that some persons don't understand the meaning of peace. Uh, this is going to be, this, we hope that this town hall meeting will be a series of, uh, of uh, events that would lead to a lasting solution. What would that solution look like and what will be the next uh, event to lead up uh, to this lasting solution of peace and even the understanding of peace? Okay, thank you very much. You see, uh, one solution to this uh, conflict is first, there should be forgiveness. And there is, should be confidence between the warring parties, the restoration of confidence. I think the next uh, program you people should uh, roll out is inviting the real people that were uh, the real victims, call them to a round table, show them that yes, they have been uh, affected by, in one way or the other, bring government, bring all stakeholders, bring all their, their perceived enemies as uh, maybe the, the warring partners, bring them together. Then they should seek for forgiveness in, uh, in front of your cameras. So this will send a very good signal to the world. People will pray for more peace on the plateau and people will be supporting in one way or the other. So that will restore confidence uh, within the dwellers of this state who have been on the loggerheads for a very long time. I think the town hall should focus on forgiveness, purely forgiveness, and restoration of, of uh, um, what do I call it, tolerance between the warring parties. Forgiveness, peace, and tolerance. Well, Garba, thank you very much. That's as much as we can take with you, but thank you for giving us your highlights from the News Central Town Hall from last Thursday in Joss. We appreciate your presence here. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. The producer says to say goodbye in 10 seconds. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs>
It's never possible to say goodbye after such a weekend well packed with plenty of news that we brought from over last week up until now to summarize or perhaps maybe even look at more critically. Thank you very much for being part of us. Since yesterday, it's been quite the blast. And to all our guests, thank you for showing up or at least being up on our Zoom feed. We enjoyed it. I enjoyed the company. Look, um, it's, uh, it's been quite the weekend. You know what I mean? I did also enjoy as well. And then the conversations as well. It's, uh, it's been sublime. And also having you at the other side, uh, just watching with us and kicking us all through from Saturday, which was an entire three hours, uh, a, a journey into Nigeria's uh, history, history and democracy and all the way down to today as well. Uh, but another Saturday, another date. Another That's weekend. Yeah. Up next week. Goodbye from Azino Appeal. And I'm Judith Atimi. I'll Bye -bye. see you in Saturday. Bye.